The alphabet has only 26 letters. It cost me $5 to produce a newspaper, and I sell it for $7, so I make $2. And that $2 goes for things like promotions, features, things to improve my paper. But what if I really wanted to compete, and I sell my paper for only 5 bucks? My competitors are still selling theirs for $7. How do I make up for the $2 loss? Well, I can sell $2 in ad space. But remember, now that I have advertisers, they're basically paying for me to operate at a loss. Now they have some amount of power over me because at this point, if my advertisers pull out for some reason, they could hurt or potentially cripple my business. Now I always have that in the back of my mind. If there's an occasion for me to do a story about them or criticize them in any way, I have to ask if it's worth it, and it might not be. But I'll tell you more about that after the commercial break. From designing state-of-the-art commercial airliners to designing the tools that help keep America safe, we have you in mind. Designing tomorrow. So a little history. Working class and radical papers have always been at a huge disadvantage, obviously. The readers have less money and the advertisers know this. And the goal of any advertiser is always going to be to get in front of as many people who can actually afford their product as possible. So, if you have a newspaper and the average person reading it makes $40,000 a year, Mercedes-Benz probably isn't going to waste money advertising in it. And this is how political discrimination is built right into the system. Let's say you have two newspapers. The one on the left is a worker-oriented paper that deals with class, labor concerns, criticism of industry, things like that. The one on the right tends to attract more professionals, less emphasis on labor or class issues. The editors and writers of these papers have certain worldviews that they then pass on to their readers. So what happens when the one paper ends up suffocating from lack of advertising support? Some of their readers find new papers, and some of their readers just get absorbed into the other paper's readership, thus making that paper even stronger. And that's basically what happened post-World War II in Great Britain. The Daily Herald, News Chronicle, and Sunday Citizen were three social democratic newspapers that collectively had a daily readership of about 9 million. Their readers had a higher opinion of those papers and read more of those papers than readers of any other popular paper, and they all failed or were absorbed into establishment systems mostly from lack of advertising support. And it's actually been argued that the loss of those papers alone was enough to seriously affect the Labour Party. Because think, if you have a paper that gives an alternate framework of analysis, influences millions of people, and all of a sudden that stream of influence just ends, politics are gonna change. And it's impossible to have a mass movement that doesn't have any major media support but which still has to compete with major media opposition. Now, media need to sell their ad space to advertisers. So how to attract companies to your media? You need to prove to them that your audience has purchasing power and thus serves the needs of the advertisers. Demographic profiles like this show who's consuming your media. Turns out the average CNN viewer owns a home and makes pretty good money which maybe is why you see ads like this on CNN. Find out how an annuity can give you lifetime income. With the new LendingTree app, you can see your full financial health. Can I find a proven approach designed to deliver results? With Capital Group, I can. But they're also mostly over 50, which is maybe why you see ads like this on CNN. AARP Medicare Supplement Insurance Plan, insured by United Healthcare Insurance Company. Become a member of Kaiser Permanente, because together we thrive. That means Aetna is helping you get ready to be the best grandmother the world has ever known. But advertisers aren't just looking for people with money. They're also looking for programs that aren't going to be damaging to their interests. Those insurance companies wouldn't feel comfortable advertising on CNN if CNN didn't constantly feature people who thought that getting rid of private insurance was insane 
If you're talking about abolishing private insurance. Abolishing private health insurance. Those are the things that I think make people say, Who, what planet are you living on? A, those are crazy ideas. I'm not in favor of them. But they're never going to happen anyway because they're never going to get through the Senate. And that's not to say that CNN and MSNBC don't feature people like this. We still rely on a system of corporate health insurance that raises the cost for all of us and excludes many of us. It's not going to solve the problem. Medicare for all, single payer does that thing. And so we have to keep driving the conversation about what we ought to do rather than hold ourselves hostage to the insecurity of a few that's driven by folks who stand to make a lot of money on the other side of this. But their voices are almost totally drowned out by people like this. The idea that people's resistance to something new or their distrust or fear about it is some concocted thing by the health insurance industry feels a little bit like doesn't actually square with reality. Like Medicare for anybody who wants it, pulls 71%. When you say it will abolish private insurance, it goes down to 41%. So that's a real thing Although, that you have to step around. So media develop specialized staff to solicit advertisers and explain how their programs will serve advertisers' needs. I always say to you know a lot of the young people that start with us, I say, you know, what do we sell here? Inevitably, they start talking about Bravo or NBC, and I will correct them and say, no, we don't. What we sell is toothpaste. We sell autos. We sell the products that our consumers or our advertisers are selling. Every single network that has ads, which is to say pretty much every single network, has some person just like that correcting the new guy's idiotic assumption that they're there to do more than just chill for their advertisers. And that's because a network's ratings directly translate to how much they can sell advertising for. For example, in 2016, MSNBC was 12th in primetime cable network ratings. But in 2019, they rose to second. And that was in part due to their near obsessive coverage of Trump, which makes this 2014 Politico clip pretty funny. MSNBC's numbers, both in terms of viewership and revenue, are declining. Right. And so the big struggle for them now is like, what do we do uh, in these off years, what do we do when we can't criticize George W. Bush? What do we do when the nation isn't excited about Obama? Like, what's our what's our game plan? I think like the only thing that could save MSNBC would be like a really really far right Republican president who they can just harp on for four or eight years. This allowed them for the first time ever to surpass CNN in how much they can charge advertisers. MSNBC made three quarters of a billion dollars in ads in 2019, and they're forecasted to make even more in 2020. CNN is about the same, and Fox News clears a billion. And it works the same in the other direction. If ratings go down, so does ad revenue. In 2015, a whole bunch of companies saw a big dip in ratings. One quarter, Nielsen had MTV and Comedy Central down about 20% in ratings, and they obviously weren't alone. Now, those are both Viacom companies. The same quarter, Viacom saw a 9% drop in U.S. ad revenue. Now, Viacom made almost $10 billion in ad revenue domestically last year. So a 9% loss in one quarter, that could be like $200 million. A 9% loss over an entire year, that could be a billion dollars. And there is the financial imperative of ratings. Because it's easy to accuse an individual anchor of selfishly doing something to boost ratings. But when a cable news network brings in a billion dollars in ads in a year, you have to take seriously the notion that people in that network feel the pressure to maintain those numbers. Pressure from the producers, the management, the CEO, the corporate board, whoever. Because those numbers translate to millions of dollars potentially. So you have to assume that instances like this Sure, is Donald, uh, you know, I mean, I've never seen anything like this. And, uh, you know, this is going to be a, a very good year for us. It may not be good for America, but it's damn good for CBS. That's all I got to say. <laughs> so what, what can I say? It's, uh, you know, the, the, the money's rolling in and uh, this is... You just have to assume that instances like that are representative of all the people in his position. Because if Sean Hannity's ratings drop by 20% in a year, that's millions of dollars. If Chris Hayes' ratings drop by 15% for a quarter, that could be a million dollars. If Anderson Cooper's ratings drop by 10% for a single week, that's money lost. But here's the bigger deal. There are enough news outlets that a single bad actor can be criticized. Even if X company sponsors X show, they're not the primary sponsor of every show, so you can have reporting like this. 
California is investigating insurance giant Aetna following a stunning admission by one former medical director. The doctor admitting under oath that he never looked at patients' records when deciding whether to approve or deny care. But this is part of that narrow dialogue I mentioned. Because huge corporate advertisers on TV pretty rarely sponsor shows that engage in serious criticisms of corporate activities. The workings of the military-industrial complex, the corporate relationships with third world tyrannies. TV networks tend to learn over time that these kind of shows don't really sell. Not to say that shows like that don't exist and won't always exist, but they just live on the margins without ad money to buy reach or equipment or slick on-air personalities to make small talk in between shows so that you've already started watching the next show before you realize the previous show has just ended. The one and only Rachel Maddow. Her show starts now. Good evening, Rachel. I'm not going to sleep all weekend. How about you? News continues. I want to hand it over to Chris for Cuomo Prime Time. Chris? Thank you, Anderson. I am Chris Cuomo. Maintaining audience flow levels like that is just one more tool for keeping up ratings and ad revenue. Now, the last thing I'm going to bring up here is branded content. Now, branded content or native content is the most clear example of exactly what we're worried about happening with regard to advertising and media. If you've not heard the term native advertising before, you have probably been subjected to it by now. It's when a piece of ostensibly normal content is stamped with tiny disclaimers like uh, this and this, and then contains messages that are often clear endorsements. That was John Oliver, and I'll link to that because that entire piece is an incredible explanation of exactly what branded content is. But even that, there's a failure to recognize the similarity between branded content and all other advertising. Because whether it's explicit or not, whether or not news anchors present their shows as being sponsored by a company or not, the news almost never fundamentally conflicts with advertisers' messaging. So whether it's implicit pressure on news people not to push certain issues, or it's advertisers just finding the media that already don't push those issues, the point is every commercial you see represents a brand or an industry that you are virtually guaranteed not to learn the full truth about when the commercial ends. And that's Filter 2. Thanks for being here. Thanks for watching. If you like this or found it helpful, please like and subscribe. It helps other people find this. And my channel, if it ever gets big enough that I get to start doing ads for Squarespace, please know that while I have sacrificed my principles, I am enjoying the money. Later.